Okay, we're in Genesis chapter 2. In verse 18, we see a new phrase in the Bible. Every time God has made something, He sees that it is good. And when He finished the six days of creation, He says, it says that He saw that it was very good. Verse 18, God says, the Lord God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. Now, um, God had already given man dominion over every living thing. And what dominion means is that man was the Lord of the whole creation. He was the king of creation. He was the boss. And God brings the living creatures before the man, and the man names them. Naming is the prerogative of ownership. I have three children. We named our three children because they were our children. Uh, I have two grandchildren. I wanted to play a role in naming those grandchildren, but my daughter and son-in-law didn't let me. They said, you had your chance. I didn't push very hard because it's not my right. They're not my children. They are my children's children. Uh, when Jesus met Peter, he gave him a new name. When he met Simon, he gave him a new name. He was demonstrating his right of ownership over Peter, that Peter belonged to him, that Peter was his disciple. Therefore, the Lord Jesus could name him. Well, Adam exercises this right of dominion in the new creation by naming the animals. But when the animals were paraded before him, I, I heard a preacher say once he didn't know whether to name it or claim it. There was no animal who was a, a suitable companion for the man in the original creation. Now, there's a spiritual pattern here in that the needs that we have drive us to God. When there's a lack in our life, when there's something absent in our life, there's something missing in our life, that's no reason to become angry with God. That's a reason to pray to God and to come close to God and to appeal to God. And I would even say that it's a good thing to be so peaceful that you can go to sleep in the will of God, that you can go to sleep trusting God, because that's what Adam did. And here we have the first case of surgery in history, and also the first case of anesthetics in history. Do you realize how many hundreds of years doctors had to perform surgery without an anesthetic? C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, says it's important to note that all the great creeds of the church, all the great creedal formulations, the creeds are when the churches say, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, forming the doctrines that all the great creedal affirmations of God's goodness were made before the existence of anesthetics. In other words, people decided that God was good before there were ever any painkillers. And surgery had to be form, performed in so many places on so many people before the pain could be dulled while the people were wide awake. But here, in the first instance of surgery, in the world, in history, there's an anesthetic. God puts the man to sleep. God knew about a surgical technique before it could ever be employed in human history. While Adam is asleep, God takes a part of him from his side and forms a woman. Now, in February, 2000, February 2000, I taught in Novosibirsk, and they couldn't find anybody crazy enough to go to Siberia in the winter, so they said, let's ask Ronnie, he'll do it. So I did it, and Alek was with me, by the way. But I remember that as we taught the students there, there were several unbelievers in the audience, and one girl, who was an obvious unbeliever, she raised her hand and she said, 
why did God become incarnate as a man? Why didn't he become incarnate as a woman? And why is it Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Why isn't it Mother, Daughter, and Holy Spiritus? She asked me questions along this line. And I said, well, when God became a man, he didn't consult with a man. He consulted with a young girl. And God received 100%. Christ received 100% of his human nature from a woman because, because there was no male agency in his conception. We're going to talk about that in chapter 3. That's actually mentioned as early as Genesis chapter 3. And I said, when God made a man, he used the dirt. But when God made a woman, he used the highest of all creatures, someone who had been made in his own image. I said, do you really feel cheated? Do you really feel that God was unfair to the woman? I don't think you should feel cheated. So he takes the woman out of the side of the man and he closes up the man's flesh, it says in verse 21. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to man. And I heard one scholar say that the proper way we should translate what Adam said in verse 23 is when he saw Eve was wow. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall, become, she shall be called woman. So he was given someone suitable to be a companion to him. This is the birth of the family. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, now, verse 24 is important. Verse 24 is important because Jesus refers to it when he is uh, ask about marriage and the permanence of marriage. It's appealed to more than once in the New Testament as a part of God's original design. It's important for a lot of reasons. Verse 24 says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, here's the first question. Who's talking here? Are we still having a quote from Adam? Because verse 21 is obviously a quote from Adam. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But then verse 24 says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and they shall, cl and shall cleave to his wife. That's not Adam talking. If he is speaking, he's speaking prophetically because there aren't any mothers or fathers. There aren't any children yet. So I don't think Adam is talking in verse 24. This is an editorial comment made by Moses. Now, there's something else we need to notice here. If you ask most American Christians, we, we have a phrase for this verse, and it's, it's called leaving and cleaving. The word cleave in English has more than one meaning, but one of the meanings is to hold on to. And so we say that, we, that marriage means we're supposed to leave, that is, we leave our parents, and we're supposed to cleave. We're supposed to cleave to the person that we're married to. So this is what we mean by leaving and cleaving. But if you ask most American Christians, who is the command given to to leave and cleave, the wife or the husband? They would say the wife, but that would be wrong. We usually think that it's the wife who has the responsibility to leave her family and to cleave for her, to her husband. Now, actually, there is a verse in the Bible that says that to the woman. It's in Psalm 45. But in the original creation, it's just as important and maybe more important for the man to leave his family. Now, what does that mean? Well, one thing it means that is that the man, the man is no longer to be dependent upon his family for an income. He's supposed to make his own way for his own wife and his own children. But it also means that he needs to leave the character, the atmosphere of his family and to form a new family. And he is not to put upon his wife the burden 
of having a family just like the family that he came from. He's not to expect his wife to be just like his mother. That's a burden to put on a woman, and it's a sinful burden. So the man has got to be sure that mentally and emotionally and physically and financially, he's left the family he grew up in so that he can commit himself to form a new family whose center is not his mother, but his wife. And many of the failures that we see in families are, are a result of the man not taking that responsibility to cut those strings to his mother and father and start fresh with the woman whom the Lord has given to him. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.